Good morning, Macworld. The first group did that. Come on, let's, let's hear it. Let them hear you on Market Street. Good morning, Macworld. Good morning. That's better. There you go. I'm Chuck Joyner from Mac Voices. I have the privilege of introducing a man who has three assets, and I can't match any of them. He has a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter, and the best hair in the business. Mr. Christopher Breen. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I've already said good morning to you this morning, so I'm not going to do it again. Were you here this morning? No. No? Okay. Then, good morning. Good morning. Very nice. If we were on the East Coast, I would say instead, how you doing? And you'd say, no. No, you don't say, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? It's how you doing. But the response is, yeah, not bad. So that is the traditional East Coast greeting, just so you know. But here in California, I say good morning, and you answer, good morning, Mr. Breen, sir. <laughs> That's the way that goes. So uh, this is the, oh, that, that's my name. That's who I am. I'm Chris Breen from Macworld. And uh, we're going to talk about stuff that's broken, or hopefully not broken, but it's misbehaving. It's cranky. It's... Um, it's just, you're having a hard time establishing a relationship. You think you've got everything going right, and it disagrees with you, and it's not going right, and so you two have to come to an understanding, some kind of an agreement. So that's what this is about today. So we're going to start with a couple of things. We're going to talk about uh, when you have problems with your computer, and also when you have problems with your iOS devices, and that would be your iPad, your iPhone, and your iPod Touch. So the first thing you're likely to ask yourself is when something goes wrong with your Mac, you say, what the heck is wrong with my Mac? Well, I have a few bits of wisdom for you. Because a lot of times, if something goes wrong, you're completely overwhelmed. You think, it could be anything. I don't even know where to begin because it could be anything wrong. It could be a broken hard drive, or the RAM could be bad, or my Mac is inhabited by demons, which happens far more often than you'd think. And so, a lot of the times when something goes wrong, you think, well, I can't, I can't do anything about this because there are too many choices. There are too many things that could go wrong. So here's where the bits of wisdom come in. This is something I've taken to heart. This was offered to me by someone in a bar who said, you have a 50-50 chance of winning the lottery. You either win or you don't. Now, somebody who was going to be picky about statistics might suggest that's not exactly the way it works. They're actually, your odds are far different than just having a 50-50 chance that either it's broken or, or you're going to win the lottery or you're not. However, either your Mac is broken or it's not. And it's probably not. And so, that means you can relax a little bit and give it a go. Because if it's totally broken, it's busted. What else, what worse things could you possibly do except perhaps put it in a dishwasher, uh, run over it with a tractor, um, fill it with cheese, which is generally not a good idea. So one thing you have to do is just sort of relax and think, well, maybe I can tackle this. And I can try these sort of benign things, get in there and monkey with it a little bit, and possibly I'll be able to fix it. And that will save me a trip to the Apple store. It will save me a huge amount of money. And if I can do that, I will also feel prouder about myself. Now, there are various ways that one can try to troubleshoot something and fix something. If you're a man, with any device, pretty much, this is what you do. We'll take a car, for example. Here's your car. What you do is you lift the hood, and you cross your arms this way, and you look at the engine. Now, if you're really good, the engine will fix itself. If you're not so good, the engine will never be fixed and you'll have to take it to a professional. Before we start talking about this, um, I want to talk about backups. How many of you have a backup of all your data? Okay, how many of you are lying? Good, okay, there's the one guy that's lying. Um, and when I mean a full backup of your data, it means I backed up, it doesn't mean I backed up six months ago. 
and now my computer's dead, and oh, I've lost six months worth of data, or six months worth of my pictures of my kid, or this video that I did. Um, it really means that if you were to lose your computer right now, this day, that you wouldn't weep. And so let's try that again. On the weep scale, how many of you would not weep? Well, you guys are really good. There are fewer of you, but that's still very good. Okay, the second part of that is, how many of you have tested your backup? Far fewer of you have tested your backup. So, it's great, right? Apple builds in Time Machine. How many of you are using Time Machine to do that? Yeah, lots and lots of lots of you. So cool, great. You think you've done the good thing. Time Machine is there, you've gotten the external drive, you've plugged it in there, and you've put it away, and you've never looked at it again because Apple never, ever makes mistakes. Data never gets corrupted. Hard drives never go bad. You've done your bit, right? It's pretty much like going to church on Sunday, and if you just sit in the building, your sins are absolved for the whole week. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to believe in it. You just have to sit there uncomfortably. That's one reason they do it. It stresses physically how forgiven you are because you're sitting there and you're getting sort of hurt and that drives home the point that you have been forgiven. In the same case with your backups, and pardon me, the half of you I've just offended, um, it's great that you've gone to the trouble of doing the backup, but if you don't test it, that backup, it's not really safe. So those of you who haven't done that or have my permission to leave right now, go test your backup and then come back and I'll be gone but I'll be back next year, so come back next year and then report, you know, and, and I'll give you a little stamp on your hand that says, yes, I checked my backup. So be sure that you've tested your backup as well. It's also not a bad idea to have multiple versions of your backup. Yes, it's fine that you have that one hard drive, but maybe you want to take the stuff that's really, really, really important and put that up in the cloud somewhere, like the stuff that you can never replace. You don't care about the work documents you did five years ago, but you really, really care about that picture of your newborn child because you can't ever repeat that picture. You can try, you know, but when they're like 22 and you put them in a crib with a diaper and you put the makeup on them to make them look kind of chubby and cute, most of the time they object. And if they don't, they need to be in therapy. Okay, so now we're going to talk about real stuff. So, in terms of backup, or in terms of troubleshooting, I mentioned that it can be overwhelming because you don't know what's broken and so you don't know where to begin. Um, if you've seen The Music Man, and I hope you have, it's a wonderful musical, um, I will not recreate it right here on stage, but they have something called the Think System. And the Think System is, if you just think hard enough, da, 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 no matter which instrument you're playing, you will be able to play that just by having it in your head and transferring it to an instrument, which is not true but it's part of the plot and we, so we believe it because otherwise the movie fails. But in terms of troubleshooting, you really want to think about it and what it means is you use your intuition based on experience. So certain things will fail at certain times as the Mac starts up. So if you can kind of learn what's likely to fail, then the next time it does, hopefully it never does, you'll have some idea so it won't be overwhelming to you. So think system is, first, calm down. Again, either it's broken or it's not. If it's broken, you're going to have to take it in and get it fixed, or you're going to have to replace it. So no reason to pump up your blood pressure. Two, you don't have to do anything right that second unless it's on fire. If it is on fire, you want to do something about it right away. Depending on the degree to which it is on fire, you may wish to leave the building quickly or deal with the fire. Most of the time, the first thing you want to do is unplug it. Let it flame on as it is, and then pull out the fire extinguisher that we all have in our homes, as you must, and squirt it. Um, that will void your warranty, by the way. So if it is on fire, um, you want to get a fire extinguisher that doesn't leave a lot of traces. So there's the white foamy stuff, leaves traces everywhere. Water, not so much. So if you can pull out some asbestos gloves, you can quickly take it to your bathtub and throw it in the bathtub unplugged, and then you can take it to Apple and just say, there was a flood. 
and they will replace it for you. So, you know that your sources are limited. There are a limited number of things that can go wrong at various times. Next thing is you want to go with the flow. And what I mean by that is understanding what the Mac does at certain times as it's coming on, as it brings up its screen, and then as it's operating. That way, you can kind of compartmentalize the potential problems, and you're good. Next thing is to sleuth. If you want to put on a special hat for that, that's OK. Uh, you want to smoke a little pipe of that, that's OK as well. The pipe industry would certainly appreciate that. When you're sleuthing, you want to consider that what have you done lately to make this happen. Um, it's like a relationship. Most of the time, when I walk into the door and a frying pan comes my way, there's a reason for it. It isn't just that my wife thought she wanted to get a little aerobic exercise by hurling frying pans at me, but no, rather it's because I didn't take the garbage out or um, I shaved the dog or something that I shouldn't have done. So consider what have you done lately that has made this a problem. And then observe the present. What's happening now that may be causing this problem? So let's start out with a dead Mac. Symptoms of a dead Mac are the Mac is dead. Pretty clear. And what that means is you push the power button and nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's just dead to the world. Yesterday it was fine. Today you push the button and it's dead. Here are your suspects. There's no power, therefore it's dead. It's in a really deep sleep. Or there's a dead battery if you're trying to run off the battery on your laptop. So let's talk about it. No power. Well, first thing you do is check to see that there's power actually going to it. So you've got it plugged into a power strip. Cool. Is the power strip turned on? There's usually a little red get down light on these things. Get down is a musical term for get down. So there's a little get down light that's red. It will tell you if there's power coming to this thing. Do you really have to translate all these jokes? Yes. Really? I'm sorry. She said me too. Wow. I'm going to try to use some really hard words. <laughs> OK. So first of all, um, the first thing you want to do is check that there's power coming to the thing. Um, maybe you've got a power strip there. And you don't, there is no get down light on there, but there should be, but there isn't. Um, one thing you can do is if it's got a little circuit breaker on it and you've recently had lightning storms or uh, you've had some kind of power outage or you had just flaky uh, power within your house, you want to go to that strip and you want to push the little button. It's a reset button. And then, maybe your Mac comes on, great, all it did is just it tripped a little circuit and you're good. What often happens to me is that I will have the Mac plugged into the strip and the get down light is good and everything's good there, but, um, well, the get down light is actually not on. And somebody has come into the room and seen the light switch and gone, boop, turned it off, thinking they were turning off the light switch, but in actuality, what they've turned off is that little power plug. So you've turned off the power and that's why it's not working. So check that. Um, really deep sleep there. Maybe some of you have these MacBook Air things or these MacBook devices that you've closed the lid to put it to sleep and you open it up and nothing happens because it won't come back from sleep. It's possible that when you think it's dead, it's not actually that all that's happened is that it's gone into this very, very deep sleep. One thing you can try to do, of course, is to restart the thing. So hold down the power button for a long time and wait for it to boot up. Hopefully that's your problem. And then there's the possibility that you've got a dead battery. You've got this off battery or off uh, power, and you think, okay, well, then I, this should be good because I've got a full battery, right? Well, something's happened and the battery is drained and that's why it's not starting up. Stick in your power cord, let it go for a bit, and then try starting up that way. Then there's the gray Mac, and I'm not talking specifically about the lovely sheen that Apple has added, but rather the symptom is you're trying to start up, and all you see is a gray screen, which is not very interesting, but it's better than a blue screen. It's classier. So the suspects of a gray screen are, your Mac is caught in a state of introspection. There's a hardware conflict. You think I'm kidding. Just well, I'll explain this. And then there possibly you have a corrupt startup drive. So the suspects 
sometimes in the case of a Mac caught in introspection, what I mean by that is I, some of you may have a very basic setup. You've got your laptop or you've got your iMac and that's it. I, however, have a Mac Pro. It has four internal hard drives. Off the FireWire port are seven hard drives. I have more USB devices than God, who has very many, but I have more. And so, what will happen sometimes on startup, particularly if you've had a problem as you shut down, when you restart, the Mac operating system is going in and it's checking all those hard drives. And in the meantime, what you're seeing is a gray screen. And so you need to just go away, have a little patience, and then you can come back a few minutes later, you find, oh, look, it booted up because it needed to go through all these checks. So hopefully that's all the problem is. If it's a hardware conflict, this is where you want to think back to what you've like, uh, recently done. So let's say you've added a new printer or you've added a scanner. Or you've dangled something off the USB port or the FireWire port or the Thunderbird port, something that's out there talking to other devices. You've added this thing, you restart your Mac, and you just see gray screen. Shut it down, unplug whatever it is that you just did, and then start it up again, and then see if it starts okay. If it does, you want to have cock a very wary eye at whatever that thing is that you've just attached. Um, if you have a corrupt startup drive or one that's feeling um, ill, it's possible that you have to boot from another volume and then try to repair it. And I'm going to talk about some repair utilities in a bit. So, I find it's always a good idea to have a bootable drive of some kind other than your startup drive. And that way you can put your repair tools on there and then repair whatever it is that you need to repair. Then there's the panicking Mac. In our world, in our world, does anybody have a PC here, Windows PC? Yeah, nobody does that. It's this, yes, I do. A our Macs do not crash, they panic. It's totally different. <laughs> and it's better. For no reason, except that we call it, we say, oh, it's panicking. And that seems more dramatic and kind of fun instead of like, oh, it crashed. No, but it's panicking. It's, ah, I don't know what to do. So, symptoms of, the, um, of a panic are, you see the little kernel panic screen, right? You've probably seen this. Something's going on, suddenly this kind of curtain of doom comes down. And it's never in English. It's always in, you know, there's Finnish translation, there's uh, Siamese, there is um, uh, something, a uh, strange Indian dialect from Bolivia. And that basically translates to, you're screwed. And that's why they don't put that in English, because you would be offended. However, you put it in these other languages, it seems very international. And you think, oh, well, that's, uh, uh, that's good. So, you can also see, as your suspects, hardware. Most of the time, a kernel panic is due to some kind of hardware problem. Um, it can also have a problem with drivers and extensions, and drivers invariably involve hardware as well, so we can put that under the hardware classification, and kernel extensions are something that you don't want to know about. So, what do you do about this? Well, first thing you want to do in terms of hardware, um, if you have recently installed RAM, like you just did, and you start this up and you see the gray sheet of doom, it means likely either you have bad RAM or the RAM you've put in has not been properly seated. Now, Apple is trying to help us in this particular situation by not allowing us to upgrade the RAM. So don't look at this as some way of forcing us to buy new Macs in a few years, but rather they're just trying to save us the trouble of seeing uh, an obscure Bolivian dialect that says you're screwed and instead you will just buy a new Mac when some minor problem happens. We also talked about unplugging stuff previously, same idea here. If you've added stuff, you may see a panic screen, unplug that stuff, restart. And then in terms of kernels and uh, kernel extensions and drivers, you may wish to safe boot. Now when you have kernel and uh, these drivers, Invariably, they're installed for something that you've added on. They're not corrupt Apple things, but rather the third-party things that you've got on there. So if you safe boot, and all you do to safe boot is restart and hold down the shift key, wait forever, because what the Mac is doing at that point is checking its internal mojo 
and seeing if it's in line with the planets. And if it is, then it will start up without loading these extensions and, uh, and drivers, and then it will start up. If it does start up perfectly, then you know where your suspect is, right? It's some kind of third-party doodad that's in there. Ideally, you would then update that doodad's drivers, or if you're that kind of person, you would dig in and look at kernel extensions, which are buried deep in the system folder. And then there's general funkiness. And this is not the um, James Brown kind of funkiness, the Prince kind of funkiness, the Parliament kind of funkiness, but rather it is uh, a general melee within the Mac. So the symptoms of this general melee is uh, crashing applications. You're trying to run an application, wham, it crashes. Uh, anybody work for Microsoft here? Okay, well that's sort of in their terms of service. Will crash on occasion. This is to be expected. Slow performance. You're using something like uh, your web browser, for example. It's just chugging along and it makes your Mac just sort of chug along and it's not good. Spinning beach ball. It's cute. It beats the heck out of a Windows little time thing, you know, the sand in the time thingy here, which is, harkens back to the Wizard of Oz, except it's not green. Instead, they give you a cheerful little beach ball, which again, translated into the Bolivian, I think you understand what that means. So what do you do about general funkiness? Well, first thing you want to do is check your memory and hard drive. In terms of memory, what I mean by that is RAM. Are you, do you, are you trying to run Mountain Lion on an old Mac and you've just got a gigabyte of RAM or a two gigabytes of RAM and you're just choking the poor thing. It needs, no, please give me more brains, give me more power. Give it more power if you can. Hard drive space. The way the Mac OS works is when it can't use RAM, what it will do is it will take some of the stuff that it's churning on, it will throw it back to the hard drive using swap files and put it back and forth in between RAM. It becomes much more flexible if there's lots of space available to you on your hard drive. If you don't have a lot of space, it's having to do these weird little swaps much more often. It slows down your Mac in a big way. So. Lots of hard drive space. The, the rule in the past used to be make sure you have 10% free space. People who know things, unlike me, say that's nonsense, that doesn't work that way anymore. But anyway, that's what we used to believe and so I will repeat it here. You also want to create a troubleshooting account. You know that you have your regular user account. When you get your Mac set up, if you haven't done this already, create a new account. Go into your account, your users and group system preference, create a new account give it either standard or administrative privileges, and then leave it alone. And the reason you want to do this is, let's say that your Mac is feeling particularly funky in that not James Brown kind of way, you want to switch to that troubleshooting account and see how it runs then. If it runs beautifully, it means your problem is in your regular account. Up to that point, then at least you know it's not computer-wide, but rather it's, um, it's a select problem. Deal with it then in your account. How do you do that? I am not going to tell you. Um, no, one way you can do that is to toss preference files and support files. Where are your preference files? Well, the way we used to find them is we'd go to the Go menu. And we go to our library folder, of course. And that seems to be missing. And the reason it is, is because Apple doesn't want you messing around with it. Because if you mess around with it, you may do something bad. And if you do something bad, then you have to take it to them and you give them money. And then they give it back to you. I don't know why they think this is a poor system, because they make money on it. So if you want to get to your library folder, all you have to do is hold down the option key and go to the Go menu. So notice, here we are showing computer. Hold down the option key, and now I'm showing you the library folder. Go into the library folder and you're going to see a bunch of stuff that you hadn't seen before. A couple of places you want to look is the application support file. There are all kinds of weird little files in there. It's possible that if you look at a troubleshooting site somewhere or a developer site, you may, they may say, throw out these support files. Where do you get them? This is where you get them. And then also your preferences files are found in somewhere in here on this computer. Oh, it's, sorry, I'm in application support. <laughs> the guy says, yeah, you think you know what you're doing. You're in the wrong directory. 
So uh, go into your preferences files here. And you're going to see a lot of things called com.blah.blah.plist. These are your plist files, your preference files. Tossing out preference files is fine. They're not um, necessary. If you throw them out when you next launch the application, the application will launch perfectly well, and it will create a new clean preference file. You may lose something like your preferences, but those can be easily brought back by just simply recreating them. We did that. We did that. We did that. Oh, clearing the desktop. Um, we got a new guy. Are you, the, are you the new guy? He's the new guy. Okay. How are you with really complicated words? Good. Okay. This is sign for I totally know my job. Leave me alone. Okay. Um, clearing the desktop. How many of you use the desktop? Those people who read sign are going, oh, yeah, man, he totally dissed you. Man. You too? Oh, yeah, okay, great. They're all out there just going, this guy is an idiot. Okay, so um, if your Mac is running, oh, no, I was going to ask you a question, but before these two distracted me. Not me, I'm very sorry, yes. Okay, um, no, you didn't. So, oh, how many of you use your desktop to put everything that you own on? Right, okay, that's bad. That's very bad. Um, why is it bad? Well, first of all, you can't see the desktop anymore because it's just totally covered with all your files. And, you, and it's hard to like, see what you're doing there. Yes, you can go into like file view and look at the, the in folders and say, oh, there's all my stuff here. What the real problem is, when you put stuff all over your desktop, the way the Mac OS treats this is each little icon, each little custom icon, not one provided by Apple, is treated as a separate window. So pretend that you have got, let's say you've got a dual monitor set up like I do. Let's say you have 400 files on your desktop, each one that the Mac OS considers to be an open window, which it has to draw like it is an open window. This will slow your Mac down in a big way. So you stop it. You too don't. There are other ways to organize your stuff than putting it on the desktop. Now, this is one of those do as I say, not as I do, because if you were to look at my desktop, it's a pigsty. But I have actually created a, an automated workflow so that you just press a key combination and everything disappears from the desktop and it goes into a little folder. So uh, it's a terrible way to organize your stuff, but I'm a not terribly well organized person. Also you want to update your stuff. So if you find things that aren't run running very well, they're kind of funky, make sure that you update your things. One other issue that people have, and this is just sort of a general idea, is that um, if you've had your copy of your web browser open for a long time and everything seems to be slowing down, there's probably a good reason for it. And web browsers are notorious for just making everything slow because they've cached all this stuff and there's memory leaks and there's this and that and that's a pain. So if you notice that your Mac is not behaving itself, it's acting slowly, shut down your web browser if you want. And you know, last but not least, you just restart the thing if you want and uh, maybe that will help. Um, you can also go into something called Activity Monitor, if I can do this properly. Activity Monitor. It's in the Utilities folder, but it's, um, it's something you can get to easily just by using Spotlight. So this is Activity Monitor. Most people who, who are not technical uh, will look at this thing and go, oh, too many numbers, and they move, and which is scary. Um, but it's not. Really what you want to do is you want to click on this CPU percentage header right here, and what that will do is it will tell you what's occupying your Mac's brain or its processor. So right now, my Mac is pretty cool. It's like, you know, the highest percent of what the finder is like 4.0. That's no big deal. If you find that you have things running on here, applications running on here that are taking like 50, 60, 70 percent of the processor, there's a problem. It means that your Mac is just overwhelmed. Now, you may see this happen every so often. Let's say if you are using a program called Handbrake to legally steal DVDs, it takes up a ton of processing time. When it's doing the rip, 
it will take up every processor you own, and if you have like a little gauge up there, you'll see it in the red a lot of the time. It's a very processor-intensive task. Some games are the same way, very processor-intensive. So you should expect to see that kind of performance. But if you're just doing nothing, you know, if you're not engaged in pirating other people's content, which you should never do, um, you should time shift it. Uh, instead, if it's just running as it's supposed to be running, then, and you see these high numbers, there's, there's a problem. So uh, try to track it down in Activity Monitor and see what's, what's pulling up all the problems you've got. Oh, and do your research. Um, every so often you may have a problem and you are not the first person to have this problem. You may feel like it, but you're not. So there are many good resources for this sort of stuff. Um, Apple has some discussion forums. So if you're dealing with Apple stuff specifically and um, you're having a problem with your iPhone or something that seems to be related to Apple's hardware. So let's say, for example, um, you're having a problem syncing your content to iCloud. You may see one or two comments about that um, on Apple's discussion forums, or you may see several hundred thousand. You want to look at the one that's the most recent, that has the most comments. The one good thing about, um, well, there are many good things about Apple's discussion forums, but they do keep the trolling down. So it's not like going to YouTube and looking at the comments there, which just sucks the life out of you and wish that you were another kind of animal. Um, but rather, there's a lot of helpful stuff there. People don't get too snarky, and they're often referring to other solutions if they can find them. So that's a good place to go. Um, I plug our own Mac 911 column because I write it, and so that's not bad. I know stuff every so often. And there are lots of other good resources. So put Google to the test and see if you can track down a fairly common problem. You are every once in a while going to have a problem that's just, you know, it's like, it's busted. You've got to go get that fixed. So you should have things in your school kit. So as I said before, you should have some kind of bootable installer so that you can put your troubleshooting tools on another drive, start it up, and then diagnose your drive that you normally boot from and see if you can fix it. So the tools that I personally recommend, and I get no money for this, unless you're, those of you who make this stuff are here, and if you want to just put something in the tip jar, that's good. Um, Disk Warrior from Alsoft, it's about 100 bucks. Disk Warrior is sort of the save your bacon tool. How many of you have Disk Warrior? Okay, more of you should have it. it um, one thing it does is it, 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 people describe it as a one trick pony, and it's not actually, it's like a two trick pony. So the first trick it does, which is very good, is it will um, look for low, low, low level corruption. And it will recreate your directory, which is the thing that's corrupted, and then it will allow you to go on with your computing life, which is very good. Um, you may use it once every couple of years, but the time you use it, you will, you will bow down to this utility because it actually fixes stuff that disk utility can't fix and, and other tools are not good at fixing. If it can't do the repair for you, it will tell you and it will say, would you like to recover the files that I can get? And it will then allow you to get those files off your drive that you can. So it's worth it for that reason as well. Tech tool. Um, is another good tool. It is more of a diagnostic tool in some ways, but um, they, Tech Tool makes something, the people that make Tech Tool make something called Protego. And this allows you to create a startup uh, USB stick or another kind of drive, and you can put all your tools on it. So it's, a, it's an automated way to do that. I think you can even do this from your iPod or your, your iPhone. And then Data Rescue is sort of the court of last resort. If you can't start up from a drive, if Disk Warrior can't fix it, if Disk Warrior can't get all the files off it, uh, ProSoft Engineering's Data Rescue can pull stuff off of drives that other tools have a difficult time with or simply can't. Um, most of these tools, uh, Disk Warrior's 100 bucks, Data Rescue I think is close to 100 bucks, and Tech Tool, they have sales a bunch of the time, so it can be you know, 70 to whatever, um, but worth having. So let's talk about creating a bootable volume. And I'm gonna go to my slides so make sure I do this properly. Yes. Okay. So, we'll go back to the desktop. We'll get rid of this. So, as you know, the way the, the Mac works now is if you have a problem and you want to reinstall 
Snow Leopard, what you have to do is boot into the recovery volume. So you restart your Mac, you hold down Command R. When you do that, up comes this different sort of partition that has the ability to run disk utility. You can run terminal if you want. Um, and you can also reinstall Mount Le uh, Mountain Lion or Lion if you're using that. The difficulty with that is that using their system, you have to be able to get onto the internet and download a copy of Mountain Lion. Now that's about four point something gigabytes of data. If you have a fast internet connection, no problem. But if you have a slow internet connection or no internet connection, it's a huge problem because how are you supposed to get this? Or you've got a data cap and you want to download this thing and you can't or you're somewhere where you can't get it. So the point of this is that you want to be able to create a USB stick that's got that recovery volume on it, plus it has an installer of Mountain Lion so that you can install the thing without having to go onto the internet. Okay, so here is our Mountain Lion installer. First thing I'm gonna go is go to disk utility. So I've got a little USB stick, it's tiny, courtesy of Dan Frakes. Thank you for loaning that to me, Dan. So that will come up in Disk Utility. I need to format this thing now because currently, if you look at this partition, you see that it is an MS-DOS formatted thingy. And uh, MS-DOS formatted thingy is not good in this case. You need a different kind of formatting scheme. So the first thing is you want to have a different scheme and what you want is Mac OS Extended Journaled. But I also need to change one other thing. So I'm going to go to the partition. I'm going to create a single partition. Oh, it won't do that because I haven't formatted it yet. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So, and then you want to go into the options. When you go to options, you want to make sure that the format is GUID partition table. GUID stands for groceries, underwear, invisible, and donut. Once you've done that, click on OK. Format, we're going to choose Extended Journaled. And we'll call this USB Stick. And then I will click on Apply. I want it to partition. It will create the partition map. And it will do the happy thing. And it will come out as this GUID Mac OS Extended Drive, which is what I need to create this installer. Okay, so that one is formatted the proper way. Now, here's my installer. So when I got this from the uh, Mac App Store, I downloaded my copy. When you do that, when you download a copy of the installer, get it out of the Applications folder. And the reason you do this is because when you install the Mac, uh, when you install Mountain Lion or Lion, what will happen is it will do the installation and then it will erase the install package. So if you've left it in applications, it will get rid of it, and then you have to download it again. So what you want to do instead is move it somewhere else. Once you move it, you can do all the installations you like, and you will still have a copy of the installer there. So I'm going to control click on this, and then I'm going to choose show package contents. So here's the contents. So basically what I'm looking at is the inside of this um, archive. Double click on contents, double click on shared support, and this is the file that I want. It's called installesd.dmg. This is where all the good stuff is for creating your installer. Go to Disk Utility again. Click on my USB stick. I'm going to click on Restore. The source, meaning this is where I need to get the installer from, is here. I will drag that into Source. My destination is this USB stick. So basically what I've said is, please take the installer and put it on this USB stick, please, and thank you. I would then click on Restore, and then we would sit here for half an hour while it created that thing. We're not going to do that. Um, however, what you'll end up with is a little bootable USB stick. So you can plug it in there. You can go to Startup Drive. You can choose that as your startup. You will start up and you'll see all the same things that you see in the, in the restore partition. The difference is you'll have a full installer there and not have to go up to the internet to do this. If you want to be tricky about this and you have a large enough USB stick, high, high enough capacity, you can put other tools on there as well. 
For the time being, you want to make sure that you have a 16 gigabyte or larger USB stick. Some people can do it with an 8 gigabyte stick. I prefer 16 because I like having the extra room and I love giving money to the people who make these things. So, worth having, make one. And these are the instructions. I'm going to post these slides up on our post slide server so you'll be able to look at these things. I wanted to include those things in there just so you knew what the uh, steps were. Oh, okay. So, you want to change your login password when you've forgotten it. This actually can happen sometimes if somebody in the family has uh, given up a uh, computer for one reason or, the, or another, or you've got one at a, at a garage sale, or you've stolen somebody's computer, and you want to be able to get into it with a login password, and you can't because you don't have the login password, and you don't want to really reformat the thing, you just want to get in so that you can take stuff that's not yours. So how do you do that? So you remember we talked about the recovery HD, so you command R to get into that recovery HD. Then there will be a utilities menu, and I'm going to show you a picture of this stuff so it makes some sense. You go to the utilities menu and you see terminal, and you choose terminal. You will enter, without the quotes, reset password, all together, all jammed together. Now I know terminal for a lot of people, you know, people get hives and things when we invoke the terminal, but it's okay, this is just one command. Enter reset password, you're going to choose the user account that you're going to reset the password for, Enter and confirm your new password, and you're good. So this is what it looks like. When you call up reset password, you will come up with this reset password window. You then choose the user account that you want to reset the password for. You enter a new password. If you want to put that little hint in there that nobody can ever guess, you know, I put in like Popo, and that could mean anything. Uh, put that in there, and then you can log in with that account. Note, however, that um, there are certain things you want. Your keychain could be messed up because it's connected to a specific uh, account and you can't do anything about that. Um, we're almost done. I'm almost out of time. Yes, I am. Uh, how can you restrict access to iOS devices? Why would you want to do that? How many of you have kids? Okay. How many of you have grandkids? How many of them spend way too much doing this and not looking at you? None of you have raised your hand, so that means you're good parents and good grandparents. I, however, will raise my hand heartily and say my daughter spends a lot of time doing this. So what you can do is you can configure your network so you can lock them out of the internet, which is evil, but cool. Um, so it won't prevent them from using their devices, but it will prevent them from spending all their time on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all the other things that take them away from the loving bosom of their family instead talking to creeps on the internet. So this is how you do it. I'm a, the basic setup for this is that you're using some kind of airport base station. So the first thing you have to do is get the Wi-Fi or the MAC address from your iOS device. So to get there, you go to Settings, General, About, and then Wi-Fi address. And here's where it is. I've blanked mine out because I don't want everybody in the whole world to know what my Wi-Fi address is on this particular device. But you will see a series of numbers and characters here, and that is the Wi-Fi address for that device. So with an airport base station, you're going to watch, you launch airport utility. You're going to select an internet-connected base station. And again, I'll have pictures of this. Click on Edit. Select the Network tab. And then click Enable Access Control. And then click Time Access Control. And it actually looks like this, not so scary. So you've launched Airport Utility, you've selected your specific base station, you click on the Network tab, and down at the bottom where it says that red circle that doesn't live there natively but I've actually added, click on Enable Access Control, and then click on Timed Access Control. Did we just do this? Oh, okay. Then we're going to click a plus. This is very simple to do. Uh, click on the plus button to add a new device, name that device, enter the MAC address, configure allowed hours, update airport base station, and it's really not that hard. This is where you're going to end up when you, once you do that timed access control thing. You can add a client, and you do that with that first plus button, where plus minus, and I've added little Bobby's iPad because little Bobby is spending too much time not paying attention to me. Then I will name it Lil Bobby's iPad, and below that will be the MAC address, and that's where it got that from its device, right? The blah, 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 blah. 
Then you click on the plus button and you can choose like weekdays, okay, between three and five, the gates will open for little Bobby to complain about me on Instagram and then at five o'clock they will shut tight thinking that I've locked him in the basement. And then Wednesday between, oh sorry, weekends between 10 and 12, again, the gate opens, he can Instagram as fast as he possibly can and uh, then the gate will shut at, um, how many of you are kids? Any kids there? Don't do this. Ever you? Anybody else? Dude, don't do this. Don't ever. Yeah, I like that. What's that? Just the shaking the finger thing? No. Oh, that's good. No, I would do this. Don't you ever do that? Um, because fortunately, kids know nothing about technology. We know it all. Dude. Um, I was lying. They know so much more than we do. Um, and of course, you know, before you start doing the terrible things like locking out your network, of course you should sit down and talk. I mean, you, you don't do this stuff, right? You would never spend all your time doing this instead of interacting with your family, right? Okay. That was an unconvincing yip. But he had to say because he's in public. In private, he's going to say, this guy on stage at Macworld, man, I own that guy. I told him to shut up in front of a bunch of people and he couldn't do anything about it. Um, so, I have, uh-oh, red light is flashing. I'm over by 16, 17, 18 seconds. So, I, at that point, I will wish you thank you very much for coming, putting up with the weird stuff I say, and uh, I hope you have a great show.